During the last several weeks, this church has been the scene of a trial. We put Christ on trial. Now, as the prosecutor, I have presented you, the jury, with the evidence against Jesus, the Christ, who claims to be the Son of God, the Savior of humankind, who would die for our sins, rise again, and live with us eternally, thus transforming our lives. In the course of this trial, we heard testimony from Matthew, who claimed that Christ came to befriend sinners. He implied that we are sinners, just like a tax collector or the prostitutes that Jesus hung out with. We heard from a crippled woman for 18 years until Jesus healed her on the Sabbath day, no less, breaking the laws that governed our worship and our relationship with God for centuries. She tried to play on our emotions by insisting that not only had she been healed, but also that we had been freed to worship God with our whole hearts. We next interrogated a woman caught in adultery who claimed Christ's forgiveness was more important than the consequences of the law. I will say she made a good point about judging others. But that doesn't change the fact that Jesus undermined the very foundation of our society by not joining in the condemnation of this sinner. And she claims the experience totally changed her life. The following week, we heard from the Apostle John, who tried to confuse the issue by talking about Jesus as the bread of life, who lives on the Word and the Lord's Supper. I think that we have made a solid case there, that this mystery religion, such as the one that Jesus is trying to start, these don't survive long. Finally, we heard from the Apostle named Simon Peter. He gave us a detailed account of the last meeting of Jesus with his closest friends, his generals, if you will, which took place on this second-story room during a celebration of the Passover feast. And at that meeting, Jesus' words and actions clearly threatened our delicate fiber of society as we know it. In essence, Jesus' plan was to turn society totally on its ear, destroying our mores and disregarding all of our norms. Now, after hearing all these witnesses, the jury was duly charged to consider the evidence, to reach a verdict, and to make the appropriate appropriate punishment. Crucifixion, in this case, As you are all aware, that verdict was reached and the accused was executed on Friday. Now, some are calling it Good Friday or God's Friday, like a dying Christ somehow won victory for God. We thought that that would be the end of it, but Mary of Magdala is the most persistent defender of Jesus. And she has petitioned the court to be allowed to come and share her testimony. We really apologize for calling you, the jurors, in this case back together, especially at this hour. Mary does seem determined to clear the name of this friend of hers. Therefore, the court calls Mary Magdala. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please take the stand. All I want is an opportunity to tell the truth about Jesus and how his transformation is also our transformation. All right. Now, you were there when he died. You heard him breathe his last breath. And I'm hoping you're here, like some claim, that maybe he just fainted or was resuscitated. Oh, no, Jesus definitely died. I saw the soldiers pierce his side with a spear. I saw blood and water run out of him. 
that's a sign, you know, that his body's fluids had gravitated to the lower part of his body because his heart was no longer pumping the blood. And after that, I followed Nicodemus and Joseph to the tomb cut in the rock. I watched them prepare his body, place it on a shelf in the cave tomb. I watched them prepare the body and roll the great stone across the opening. Yes, Jesus was definitely dead and buried. Then why have you persisted in petitioning this court to have further tests? I mean, to share this testimony. I mean, why have we dragged these good people from their homes on this one day of the week where they could be sleeping in or getting other things done if Jesus is dead? That's the end of it. We are so sorry, members of the jury. This obviously is another one of those frivolous suits. But Jesus is not dead. That's what I tried to tell you when I was here last time. After the burial, I went to observe the Sabbath. It was really hard to thank God for his goodness, and I kept thinking of Jesus all through the prayers. I went to bed, but I couldn't sleep. And when it was almost morning, I got up and I made my way in the dark back to the tomb. I thought that just being close to Jesus, even in death, might ease the pain of my grief a little. Yes, and that's understandable. It must have been a terrible night for you. Now, I know what's coming next. We've all heard the story of you finding the stone rolled away, of your getting Peter and that other disciple, and of their finding the body had been stolen. I mean... They may even have done it themselves. We've been looking into that because grave robbing is a very serious offense. Now, I do hope you're not going to try to convince this court that the absence of the body proves Jesus' claim to be able to rise from the dead. I did hear rumor going around to that effect. But it's no rumor. I saw Jesus. He spoke my name and I recognized him. I touched him, even tried to cling to him, but he wouldn't let me. He explained that he must return to the Father so that his spirit could be with us always. I wasn't sure I knew what he meant about the part about the spirit. Mary, Mary, try to think about this rationally. You were stressed out and exhausted. You were overcome with grief. And someone, perhaps the gardener, spoke to you, tried to comfort you in your overwrought state, wanting so much for these events of the previous days to be undone or untrue. You imagine that this person was Jesus. Now that makes a lot lot more sense, doesn't it? I can only tell you what I saw and heard and experienced. I did think it was the gardener at first, but when he spoke my name, I knew that it was Jesus. And when I looked at him directly, I saw that he wasn't Eddie as he had been, all bruised and bloody. He was different than I had ever seen him. He appeared like the description Peter, James, and John gave of him when he was transfigured on that mountain. He was transformed in a way that I just can't describe. You have to have been there to experience the risen Christ for yourself to understand. Yes, well... That was an experience limited to you, and I guess if it gives you comfort, then there's no harm done. But you really can't expect this court to take the words of a woman of your history of mental instability without other witnesses. We really must close this case. The court and these good people of the jury can't be expected to get excited about the spectral vision of one woman. But there are other witnesses. First, there are the disciples who spoke with Jesus after I did, and then there was Thomas, who actually put his hand in the wound in Jesus' side. And what about the two disciples who met Jesus on the road to Emmaus, but didn't even recognize him until he broke bread in their own home? And don't forget the thousands, no, Millions of people who have been transformed and whose lives have been changed by believing that through the forgiveness of sins brought about by Jesus' death and resurrection, they are now children of God. All of these people can testify that my story is true. You're getting excited. You know, please try to calm down and stick with the facts. But these are facts. Jesus Christ was truly the Son of God. He gave up his power and glory to live and die for us. By believing that through him we are forgiven of our sins, we have the hope of eternal life with God. He has made us brothers and sisters, and through him we can now call God our Father too. 
We continue to meet Jesus and be nourished in faith through the working of the Holy Spirit in the word and sacraments. And this transforms us. It gives us hope for the future, for life after death. But more than that, it transforms us now in this life. Having a continuing relationship with God makes even the pains of this life endurable. It makes how we relate to each other and to all people different. For we see each other in the loving eyes of Jesus Christ. And it unites us with people in every time and place. In fact, it especially unites us on this day as believers in Jesus all around the world who celebrate his resurrection with that ancient greeting. Christ is risen. People of the jury, you know how to respond. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia.